How great has God been to all of us through our lives? If you're able to inhale and you're able to exhale, he's already showed his greatness. We are here another Sabbath. Coming towards, I believe, is this the last Sabbath of August? Praise the Lord that you're able to open your eyes and be in your right mind. That you're able to just look upon new births of children. Even when we look at our children here, we can remember when a lot of these youngins were the size of that newborn babe right there that Sister Sixta is holding. And we watch these seeds grow. And that's the way we should see when we plant seeds for the kingdom and to other people and within ourselves, we should see growth as well. Amen? Amen. And so I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. And if I can just get everyone to just please stand and can we read responsively. I'm going to start at chapter 15 and we're going to end at chapter 21. If you are able to, if you are able to, just please stand as we read the word of God. Joshua chapter 2. What book is that? Joshua. All right, chapter 2. And we're going to read responsibly verses 15 to 21. When you're there, let the church say amen. 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 This is the promise to Rahab. Verse 15 says, then she let down... Let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. All right. And then men said unto her, We will be blameless. Of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. All right, verse 19, and it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street. His blood shall be upon his head, and we will be what? Guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon them. And all together, and she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. May the Lord add a blessing reading to his word. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Some of you already may be familiar that I like to use illustrations dealing with my car. And the reason I do that is because I've had a lot of issues with cars in the past. Uh, sometime back, a few years ago, on my way to work to Dover, I found myself in my vehicle stuck in the front yard of someone else's property. How I got there is a long story. However, since you've asked, uh, 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 what happened was I was running late one day, uh, uh, Elder Marvin, and, and, and you know, running late, people that are driving in front of you seem to be driving a little slower. So I thought I had a, a room if I would cut to the left, and as I cut to the left, I seen another vehicle coming uh, in the opposite direction, and I did not have time to make it in back into the right-hand lane, so I had to swerve further into the left into someone's yard. Unfortunately, I had misjudged the opening between me and the other vehicle. And as I veered into the other yard, my two front tires are in the ditch of mud. 
Mind you, it had rained. The, uh, uh, it was raining during that day. And so as I'm sitting there stuck, the owner of the property comes out. I said, my Lord, I, I, I can see it already. You know how somebody likes to cut their grass, Sister, uh, Sister Street, and they like their yard to be perfect. And now I put two dents into their lawn. But yet they came out and asked if I was all right, and I said yes. And, and as I asked them to try to help me push out, I found myself trying to push the accelerator to go forward, then backwards. But all I found myself doing was digging my car in deeper. The, uh, uh, the owner of the resident could not help me. Not only am I stuck, I'm also running late. Fortunately, the resident was nice enough in his assistance, but again, the road, the, uh, the, 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 the ground was so saturated, and without any tools to assist in pulling me out of this situation, we had to resort in calling the state police. Now it even gets worse. Uh, uh, to provide for assistance. And, and, and one thing I, I, I don't like to do is call the state police to come out because, unfortunately, I had to get a ticket for reckless driving. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, 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 so when he came to the scene, uh, uh, it made it possible that we needed something a little stronger. And, and so to remove myself from the scene without needing uh, 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 the assistance of the owner of the vehicle or the state trooper, we had to call a tow company out. And so the tow company has what they call a tow line. And, and this tow line would grapple up underneath the front of my car and pull me out, but they couldn't get into the front, so they had to take it from the back. And as they pulled out, I wouldn't have been able to move forward or backwards if it wasn't for that tow line. How many of us can relate to the story of being stuck, stationary, unmovable, or perhaps even trapped? Perhaps the wheels of our lives are just spinning and churning deeper and deeper into a stationary mud, keeping us grounded from moving forward. Unable to gain any traction to elevate ourselves to move forward and gain freedom from our circumstances. Yet if it wasn't for the assistance of an outside force, that tow truck... Stay with me now. I wouldn't have been freed from my confinement to be able to move forward to my destination. And so for the next few moments, I, I want to share with you the story of a woman who was tired of being stuck, tired of being stationary, tired of being unmovable, tired of being trapped, Sister Richie, in the same place and trusted God to provide not a tow line to access her freedom, but a lifeline from God. For the next few moments, I would like to speak on behalf of Rahab under the title, There is a Lifeline. There is a Lifeline. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. And we come to you, Father God, because we need a lifeline. Lord God, I don't know what others have gone through this week, but others were face forward in the ground, stuck, not being able to move forward. But yet, somebody had to cry out for that lifeline. So, Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will give us the comprehension and understanding of the reading of your word. We ask, Lord, that uh, 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 the speaker will be behind the cross so the, 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 the body would be a, uh, a representation of your vessel. And so now, Father, forgive us of our sins and blot out our transgressions. Order our steps and guide us in your path of righteousness. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the church of the living God say amen, amen, in amen, amen. There is a lifeline. There's times in our lives, like the one I experienced, which as human beings, we are going to need assistance. Are you hearing me? Uh, 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 Sister Hamlet, uh, 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 my assistance that morning was a tow line. And to be perfectly honest, that tow line became my lifeline because I had to get to work. Remember, I was late, amen? And, and I had to get to work. You see, if I don't work, I don't receive my salary. 
If I don't work, I can't pay my bills. If I can't pay my bills, then I lose my car to repossession. If I can't pay my bills, the electric and the gas and the water is disconnected and the mortgage becomes delinquent and the list goes on. Do you see where I'm going this afternoon? That tow line became my lifeline that day. In other words, a lifeline is anything which someone or something depends on and which provides a means of escape from a difficult situation. Lifelines can come in various forms or various reasons and even the various circumstances. And this lifeline is divine, I'm sorry, defined as a line for saving life, something to grasp where, 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 where is danger. It provides safety. It provides support, assistance in a critical time. The most familiar type of lifeline is a rope that can extend great distance. All of you may know of, uh, of a rope that when you're thrown out to someone in need, especially life-threatening situation, oftentimes it is thrown out to rescue someone who can't swim or anyone trying to tread rough waters during the storm at sea. I know my elder and his family are familiar with the rough waters of the ocean because they have surfboards and they have trained and taught their children to be water babies. And we know that if you go too far out in the deep with the waves, the tide can pull you in. I know because one time playing with my son on the beach, I wanted to get further out into the waves, Sister Shirley, and the next thing you know, I could not get forward. So what happened, I had to wave my hand out because I could not get back. The waves were pulling me back and I couldn't get to shore, but there was a lifeguard yeah. that threw out a lifeline so that I could get back to shore. That is a true story. Oftentimes, you will see a lifeguard patrolling the beach equipped with some sort of lifeline device as they monitor the people in the ocean. And the most common is used by sailors in which lifelines are attached to large size rings. I call them lifesavers as rescue methods on boats. If you've ever watched the show, um, I think Dangerous Catch, they say that you have to be careful when you're in the ocean deep out fishing because you can get thrown over. But if you do not have this lifeline with this ring, you may be lost, which may lead to death. Movies or television shows have often depicted that the scenario uh, of someone that is stranded in quicksand, you've ever seen that? And the only option of saving themselves is by grabbing a strong vine, just so happen to be there, amen, from the ground and pulling themselves out towards safety. But many of us have been brought to safety more times than none, let's be honest. Uh, uh, if truth be told, many of us are here this afternoon only by the grace of God because somewhere along the way, a lifeline was extended to all of us and we decided to grab hold and hang on. Yet some of us still refuse to grab hold unto, into the arms of safety and rather struggle to keep our heads above water. My Lord, we refuse to hold on because we won't let go of pride. We won't let go of stubbornness. We won't let go of selfishness. We won't let go of being a narcissist or pessimistic. And we won't let go of hellion behavior. Rather than holding to the Holy Spirit, we hold on tight to the materialistic aspects of this world. So many of us don't even realize we're sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss of Sheol. And yes, Sheol, they say it is the terminology for hell, but in the Hebrew and the Greek, what Sheol really means is the grave. Yet the good news is that God always has enough spiritual rope, amen, uh, uh, to rescue us from our circumstances. Can I get an amen this afternoon? You see, God's commission to Joshua was to make him the new leader of Israel. And if we go back to the book of Joshua, we find that Joshua has been commissioned. We're talking about Joshua chapter 2 and 6. Joshua has been commissioned by God to be the new leader of the Israelites following the death of his predecessor, Moses. Joshua is given motivation from God, encouraging him with the words, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Reassuring Joshua that God will always be with them and his people. It's here in chapter 2 that we read that the 
Israelites are preparing their advancement across the Jordan into Canaan towards the fortified city of Jericho, which Joshua has now deployed two of his special forces agents to provide some reconnaissance and to report back what kind of enemy they may face. And now Jericho, if I can give you a little bit of uh, uh, history, Jericho lied about five miles west of the Jordan River, and the city was a wonderful oasis of flourishing with date palms and banana trees and sycamores and various vegetation, and the city was known as the city of palm trees. Ironically, a palm tree or a palm branch is known to symbolize victory, triumph peace, and eternal life. But the actions of the Canaanites who occupied this living space were no more than contrary to that symbolism. The spies that were sent to collect information had encountered a world, Sister Street, that was definitely opposite from theirs. It was not uncommon. Hear me now. I want you to imagine yourself walking into Jericho. It was not uncommon for somebody to walk through Jericho and smell the charred remains of infants being sacrificed to the known god Baal. It was there that the aromatic fragrance of incense tickled your nostrils, directing your attention towards the temples of false worship. It was there that the prostitutes posing as priestesses tempted those who would allow themselves to be guiled by the temptations of lust. It was there alongside the prostitutes that male sodomites welcomed whoever into their worship services in drinking and gluttonous filled orgies. It was there that anything goes and the motto was what happens in Jericho stays in Jericho. It was there in Jericho was the home of the Canaanites, the idol worshipers, the pagans, or should I say they were proud to consider themselves a sanctuary of sinners. Believe it or not, there are many subjected to living in environments all too similar to Jericho, environments that have drained the life out of so many due to the vampirism of sin. Environments so toxic that the odds of escaping and making it out alive are slim to none. Our cities, our cities have been overpowered by the spirit of Jericho. Are you hearing me this afternoon? And even inside our homes, the spirit of Jericho resides even for those who come to the church professing the fourth commandment. Yet, in all actuality, it's just noise because they truly believe nor practice the obedience of God's law. Are you listening to the preacher this afternoon? Am I talking to someone listening right here and right now? None of us should. I want any parts of Jericho. None of us should want any parts of Jericho, and neither did those two spies. But God had a plan for them. And for an unlikely woman, what I love about God is that he has a way of getting our attention even if we're paying attention. Amen? Oh, even if we're not. I'm sorry. Even when we're not paying attention. He has a way of getting our attention. That is why this encounter with Rahab and the harlot is so special. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. You see... Although Jericho housed the pagan community, Rahab was still considered gutter trash. You see, she wasn't a temple priestess, so her credentials, Sister Richie, as a woman who slept with men for money, made her a tramp. It made her a slut. It made her a whore. She wasn't the classy escort from the temple of Baal, no. She was a woman who gave her body to any man who paid the right price. And her home symbolized the similar life she lived on the wall. Allow me to explain. You see, the lower class houses were found built between the upper and lower walls. Uh, 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 she was the lower class. Uh, the less fortunate, the needy, the disenfranchised, better yet, the deployable. And Rahab wasn't able to enjoy fortunate pleasures of luxury by occupying the temple courts, or she wouldn't have, have been shunned for her profession. Are you hearing me? And it's amazing how society today still has a justifiable rating system when it comes to immoral lifestyles. For example, when a woman sells her body to the wealthy, she is considered an escort. Yet, if she walks the back streets of Baltimore, Philly, or Chicago to the average John, she's been considered a prostitute. 
You can live in the upper class suburban area and struggle with opioid addiction and, and viewed as a victim needing rehab, yet struggle with addiction in the inner city and you're classified as a crackhead with no hope. In other words, no matter where we go, what we do, and who we are, sin always finds a way to cause division within its diabolical infrastructure. Yet there's something about this Rahab. Although she is a prostitute, there is something very special about her. And what makes her special is even though she has been reduced to prostitution, she is still workmanship of the almighty God. Are you hearing me? Somebody needs to hear that today. No matter how defiled you've been, no matter what is going on in your life, despite your faults, God still loves you. Oftentimes, we can judge a book by its cover and write our own biographies of individuals' lives only through our assumptions. Amen? One may feel as though Rahab, the harlot, enjoys her lifestyle rather than take in consideration that this was her only choice of survival. How often do we sit back and perhaps process that many are in a crisis when immoral behavior seems to be the norm in one's life? If we could use our imagination and peel back the layers of Sister, Rabbi, uh, uh, Sister Rahab, uh, uh, Sister Johnson, we would come to the conclusion that her lifestyle isn't a normal path of behavior for human beings. As a matter of fact, nothing is in Jericho. We may assume that uh, uh, they want to be in that situation. And, and this is why before we go making assumptions about someone's behavior, we must first start investigating the root cause of their problem. Stop judging people for what's going on in their life and what you hear and stem down and find out what is really happening. And the many times the way you can do that is just asking them, are you okay? But we are all human because I've made that mistake. I've made assumptions. I've looked at things, but the Holy Spirit keeps working on me to say, no, don't have to say much. Just listen. And better yet, instead of hearing all the gossip of what's going around town, start praying for that brother or sister that's going through some drama. Amen? You see... We make assumptions about someone's behavior. We must first investigate the root problem. Did you know that once a woman lost her husband in the ancient Near Eastern culture, that the only way for survival was by any means necessary? In other words, no husband can lead to certain death. There was no welfare system established for survival in Jericho in that day, ladies and gentlemen. We have to cease from trying to diagnose the problem without having a Ph.D. in behavioral science. A lot of times we like to judge people's behavior, but we haven't even been educated on it. Amen? We've just been educated that a sinner is a sinner, and they just, they just rotten and bad, but yet we forget that we were sinners as well and still stand in the need of prayer for the glory of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about lifelines this afternoon because the difference between a young unwed mother, a gang-initiated young man, a struggling addict, a sexually abused or sex trafficked individual, a domestic violence recipient, someone confused about their sexuality, and families in crisis dealing with dysfunction from becoming a statistic of this immoral status quo is if the church is willing to listen to Jesus and throw out a lifeline, amen? I'm sure we can all relate because we've all needed a lifeline. Come on now. We've all needed a lifeline. Now, going back to the text, we understand that there are two Israelite deacons uh, 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 in uncharted territory and, and, and out of their comfort zone. Uh, they're used to order and chaos, elder. Uh, they're used to divine worship, not paganistic rhetoric. They've been used to being in the presence of God to which it began to make them stand out. There's something about the aura that we have when you are a Christian. Yet, I know that we aren't perfect, but yet there's something that changes. Your walk changes, your talk changes, your dress changes, everything else. And I know a lot of times we try to point out people that uh, you're not Christian because you had on lipstick or nail polish or jewelry or whatever else. But I will tell you something. There are some dried lip 
non-jewelry wearing, uncombed hair individuals that reside in the Adventist church that are not saved. Are you hearing me? So before we start judging people that has nothing to do with salvation, we need to start looking at people within their hearts. Can I get an amen? Their demeanor wasn't the same, which brought them unwanted attention. You see, people know when you walk into a neighborhood and you don't belong there. Uh huh. You, you get what I'm saying? That's why you don't just walk down North Philly or, or, or down in Baltimore or anywhere in Philly and, and looking directly in the people's faces because they know who's in and they know if you are out of town. So these people in Jericho knew that these two deacons uh, uh, from the Israelite camp were out of towners. Even Rahab notices this. And fortunately for them, they are welcome into the harlot's house. Can you imagine how many phone calls Pastor Joshua would have been given today if someone in the congregation found out that these two deacons of First Millsboro, Seventh Day Adventist Church, just stepped into a prostitute's house and didn't even ask the question? However, believe it or not, not many of us avoid, uh, many of us avoid witnessing to people because we feel that God's standards are so high. Let me say this again, that God's standards are so high that the Holy Spirit won't even enter because he disapproves of one's lifestyle. I remember I heard somebody say that he said, the angels can't, they will not go into a movie theater or a bar and everything else like that. Let me tell you something. That's when the Holy Spirit does his best work. I know I'm a living product of that. I'm a living product when my conscience was always hearing me. You don't need to be here. Because you got to understand it's the Holy Spirit that will direct you out of there. My pleasure principle would have been wherever I was at. We got to be careful how we look at people, how we give people certain it, uh, certain quotes and everything that does not pertain to what is being said or just making stuff up. Understand that Jesus went to the cross so nobody would be lost. And he will fight the battles that need to be fought because he can win them. And I look at it today, and, and, and if we are too afraid to witness to somebody because their lifestyle uh, and fear that it may rub off on us. Yes, I've heard somebody say, no, you got to be careful. Now, I get it. If you have been struggling with alcohol, I'm not asking you to walk into a group of gentlemen drinking and everything, so that might be a, 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 a setback for you. No, but what I'm saying of it is, is that if individuals' lifestyle can rub off on you that easily, then we need to start studying harder. We need to start praying longer. We need to start asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to make us stronger because that's who the people we have to go out to to witness. For whatever reason, God led these men into this house because God knew that Rahab needed a lifeline. Come on now. Uh, uh, amazingly, God orchestrates Rahab saving the two spies first. Now, many of us have read this story and it has been pointed out in commentaries that in order for Rahab to save these two spies from the king's men is that she had to lie. That they had been there and, 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 and I'm sorry, that she had to lie, right? To save these two spies from the king's men. And the whole time that they were underneath the flax. Hear me now. This is scripture. Now, before anyone gives their interpretation, realize that the Bible doesn't condone lying. And in no way does the Bible glamorize Rahab for what she had done. Yet, we never hear the two spies chastising or condemning her either while this whole charade is going on. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there was something in the seminary. They asked this question. You know, let me give you a little bit of history. Uh, uh, um, when Hitler took over Germany... Uh, um, there were seven-day Adventists there, and, and there was this litmus test that asking the question. Um, there was, um, and believe it or not, there were some Adventists that turned some Jews over to the Nazis. Why? Because they said that I will not lie. Now, the question would come and say, if you had some Jews knocking on the door, knowing that they were going to Auschwitz, 
and you let them in and you hid them. And then the Nazis came by and knocked on your door and asked, do you have Jews hiding in your house? What do you do? Don't answer that question. I just want you to process that. Just let you think on that and pray on that. You see, never do we hear the men chastising her about her telling that they weren't there. But I've noticed from a small scene is that even though someone may profess their faith, hear this, this is where I'm going, profess their faith for God, they still have struggles in their lives. Because somebody would still say, look at her, she's still a heathen, she's lying. Are you hearing me? Now, Rahab is a Canaanite woman, and she has been accustomed to the immoral lifestyle of her environment for quite some time. And Rahab is a victim of circumstances, and she still has some way to go. Now, that's similar to the nation of Israel. They were enslaved for 400 years, and we always scratch our head and be like, I can't believe they were so hard-headed. Well, you be enslavement for that long and see if you can get past the trauma or the PTSD of what's going on. You got to understand, in this walk with Christ, it is a journey. Sanctification is of a lifetime. I'm not saying we practice sin, but what I'm saying is stop being so hard on individuals that fall and help pick them up. Are you hearing me? This is a journey we're all struggling with, and that's why we keep preaching about being united so that we stop pointing the fingers at each other and start pulling each other up, or we're not going to make it. And although the lie was not in favor of God's command, he realized that we as human beings have to go through a transitional phase, and it was her heart that he judged her character. I say this because Rahab confesses her faith, and in God of, and, and, and the God of heaven, after hearing the miraculous things he has done for the Israelite people. Verses 9 to 11, it says this when we read it. I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before, before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were what? Beyond the Jordan and Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, this is what she say is, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. You see, her hope was receiving the same blessings as the children of Israel. Are you hearing me? She's willing to sacrifice her citizenship, her city, her friends, and her career just so that her and her family can have a better life with the people of God. It is here that faith in Yahweh, the God of heaven, is being put into action. And the problem for many of us today is that we aren't trying hard enough. We just don't want to let go of the things that keep us stuck in the worldly rather than we reach out for God and connect with the Holy Spirit and seek better. How many of us know when we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing, let's just say practicing on a daily basis, nothing went right. I don't care. You might have got some pleasure in the beginning, but you got some pain in the end. Are you hearing me? And so when we go into this, we got to understand that we have to walk with God. God will make it better. Even if you have trials and tribulations, he's going to build you and make you stronger to persevere. I share with New Life, I said, listen. When it comes to death and it becomes to abuse and it deals with other things, the things we go into in life, you know, we might ask the question, where is God at this time? But I let you know something. For me, I'm just saying for me, every situation that I go through in life, every tough journey, I look at it as God uh, 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 training me to be tougher, to be able to be stronger, to deal with the next outcome coming. So understand this. You may not be being picked on by God. Listen, because God loves you. But understand, you're going to have to go through some things to make you stronger for what's going to come down the pipe in these last days. If you can't be strong now, you can't be strong there. But, that's, but let me tell you something. Many of you are sitting in these pews are stronger than what you think. Are you hearing me? You just haven't been really tested yet. 
And so Rahab, I'm going to get back. I'm almost done. I'm almost, I'm almost done. Uh, Rahab in the story, can, uh, can you see her desperation each day and night living the life of a harlot? Can you see it, the tears running down her face each evening as she tries to rub the smells of the drunken men's sweat off her body? Can you see it, the black and blue bruises around her arms where someone decided to become rough with her? Can you hear it, Rahab crying herself to sleep each night? night seeking a way out. Here is a woman who now has an opportunity to do something about her life and she's not going to let it pass it up. And so when you look into the text of Joshua 12 to 21, I, I, I won't go into it. I'll let you go ahead and read for time. Rahab lets, down, lets them down by a rope out of the window and they promise her that she and her family will not face death when God's people return to overthrow the government of Jericho. That right there should give you goosebumps because there are familiarities that run throughout the Bible that enhances our understanding of God's magnificent grace for his people, Sister Lola. You see, are you listening this afternoon that Joshua sends these spies as a final attempt to see what is going on before they bring the wrecking ball of God upon the inhabitants of Jericho. You see, sounds familiar. Come on now. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Out of these many, they find a sinner. Come on now. Who is willing to sacrifice everything they know to save themselves and their family. Hey, aren't, you, uh, aren't you familiarizing yourself of what you had to let go when you decided to let God take over your life? Do you know you don't have the same friends you used to have? You might not talk to your family anymore, not because of you, but they won't speak to you. You don't do the same habits. Can't you kind of familiar yourself with Rahab? Now, I, what I found amazing is that the two spies instructed Rahab to hang a scarlet cord outside of her window so that they would know to pass by the home and they would remain safe. And the two spies referenced the scarlet cord to recognize Rahab for a specific purpose. That purpose was to identify as someone unclean, an outsider, not of Israel, but of the world, a person we call a sinner. Now, when we read the Bible, we can find that the word scarlet is used in many ways, one most importantly connected with immorality, lust, infidelity, prostitution, and sin. It is, is it my imagination, or doesn't the Bible describe in Revelation 17 describe the judgment of the great harlot as being what? A woman arrayed in purple and scarlet? Harlots are identified with the color of scarlet. You see, what I love about this story let me say this again. What I love about this story, Elder Hamlin, is that the two spies provided Rahab and her family with a physical lifeline to escape the destruction of Jericho, yet God was providing a spiritual one for the rest of her life. Uh, uh, what, Ra what Rahab didn't realize was the same window she let those two spies escape would have significance in her life. Understand this afternoon, family, that windows in a humanistic sense symbolize desire and freedom. Let me say that again. Windows in a humanistic sense, symbolized desire and freedom. That window in scarlet cord would be the beginning of her journey getting closer to God. You see, this scarlet cord signifies the source of redemptive hope. Remember, we are talking about lifelines. Get this now. This story is that of the Passover in Egypt. You remember, and I'm going to share the same typological interpretation that is the scarlet cord, like the blood of the Passover lamb points forward to who? The ultimate redemptive hope in Jesus. Christ. Oh, I didn't forget to tell you too, is that scarlet also symbolizes courage. It also symbolizes joy. It also symbolizes force. And it also symbolizes passion. All characteristics of Jesus. I'm here to tell you this afternoon that many of us at one time was in Rahab's shoes. We may not have been a harlot, yet we all were still sinners. Yet if not for the grace of God, when God didn't give up and sought to seek us out, he provided a lifeline covered in scarlet. Come on now. I'm talking about the radiant red blood of Jesus Christ to help us escape out the window of our rigidness and into the arms and safety of Jesus. Shall we be reminded that the name of the Lord 
Lord is a strong tower, that the righteous run to it and are safe. Shall we be reminded that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble? Shall we be reminded that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in other words, we may have a high priest that sticks closer than a brother. Uh, and that, my friends, is Jesus Christ. And the Lord says, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and do what? Seek them out. Rahab and each of and every person who has and who is struggling to get out of the hood, struggling to get over addiction, struggling of being disenfranchised, struggling to make ends meet, and struggling to be happy, these are the individuals that represent Rahab. God is seeking a people that want to come out of Egypt and come out of Jericho and come out of Babylon, a people who aren't going to sit around all day and complain that nothing is ever going to change. Oh, there's something about the grace of God. We should be able to yell out loud and scream hallelujah because Rahab was not chosen because of her sins. She was chosen in spite of them. She chose to repent of those sins when she confessed that God of Israel was the God of all mankind. She might not have been living the right way at the time, but God was planning to use her for a special purpose. God not only used her to hide the two spies, God not only used her to help the spies escape, God not only used her to save her family and herself, yet God used to usher the salvation to become a reality. We can only, only hope to have the same incident happen for us to gain salvation. You see, if we don't believe me in these scriptures, and we can tell you that not only did God provide a lifeline for Rahab and Jericho, he rewarded her faith by also being a contributor of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Can I go back to that? Not only did Rahab save those spies, but she became within the bloodline of Jesus Christ. If she was not in that bloodline, there is no Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is that God starts from the bottom and builds you up. Oh, come on now. Rahab signified the promises of God and the triumph miracle of uh, escaping damnation and entering into salvation. Once she united herself with the Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings, and when we are united in Jesus Christ, somebody should be shouting right now. We can always escape from sin and be rescued through his salvation. Jesus will always provide a lifeline. We just have to hold on because Jesus is our lifeline. Jesus is our aid. Jesus is our self-keeper. Jesus is our sustenance. And better yet, Jesus is our salvation. Glory to the Lamb of God. How many of us know that we need a lifeline in our lives? Come on now. How many of you know that if it wasn't for Jesus reaching out his hand and grabbing you out of that mire, oh, where would you be if it wasn't for Jesus pulling you out of alcohol, pulling you out of drugs, pulling you out of addiction to porn, pulling you out of all the wretchedness of this world? Where would you be? Remember... There are many Rahabs that are trying to get out of Jericho. It is up to us to help witness to those individuals. It is up to us to pray for them and tell God there's a scarlet cord coming out of their window and they want to be saved. It is up to us to be the light of the kingdom and show somebody to salvation. Let us be those two spies. Let somebody come out of Jericho. Help the Rahabs that is in your family. Help the Rahabs in the neighborhood. Help the Rahabs on your job. Help the Rahabs wherever you meet them. We need to get out of here. Keep asking God to help you as well because Jesus is coming soon and he's looking for a people to obey his law and to follow him and to bring people into the kingdom to be disciples for him. Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. I'm telling you, no matter what 
you are going through in this life, hear me. I don't care who talks about you. I don't care who, 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 who gives you an evil stare. I don't care what anybody says. Who cares? Understand this. God loves you. We talked about it today in the Sabbath school lesson. Why does God want revenge? We had a lot of good answers, you know. God's bringing his wrath because there's disobedience. God is bringing his wrath because sin has just been running rampant. But you know, God is not a God sitting on a throne wearing a black suit with a sickle like the Grim Reaper. God's not waiting for any of us to mess up. The problem of it is is that God is our Father. And when we say Abba Father, we say Daddy, right? And the thing about it of it is, God's hurt. Why is God hurt? Because every child he loses in this war, this great controversy of sin, that's it. Now, if you're a parent, and I said this early today, and you lost your child. You want vengeance. Yet we know as Christians we have to dig deep inside and ask the Holy Spirit to help us forgive because vengeance is His. But God's a just God. And God's is coming to bring His wrath because the enemy has taken too many of His children. The enemy right now has some of his children struggling to make ends meet, struggling to get out of addiction. I say these things all the time because we see it, struggling with having to watch the same uncle who's molested them over the years, struggling to not have people hold their past on them after something that happened 30 years. Sin is causing us to go through division. That's why God is allowing Jesus to come back, is to wipe all that out and to wipe away all of our tears. God is providing the lifeline through Jesus Christ. Sin made us age. Sin... Can I say this, Brother Marvin? Sin has allowed the parents we love for so long to forget about who we are. But guess what? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he's provided a lifeline that when it's all said and done, whether our eyes are open or we're sleeping in the ground, daddy's going to be like this. Come here, son. When Jesus touched you, Sister Ethel, you won't have to worry about that wheelchair anymore. When Jesus comes, Sister Feeney, there's no more walker. When Jesus comes, I won't have any more gray hair. <laughs> I may be taller. Hold on. Just hold on. Because he's always got that lifeline out there. You know what, today I'm just going to ask if we want to just hold on to that lifeline. Just stand with me. And we're going to hold on, amen? Ain't that something how...
Ahab. One that said the least of these is in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. But you know what that speaks of? Because guess what? We're in the bloodline with Christ as well. There's a lot of life lessons in the word of God. We just have to stay studying and believe it. If you need special prayer, just raise your hand. We're going to pray with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you gave us life this morning. We thank you that for many who are dealing with grief, that you allowed us to be able to not stay shut in, have wrapped your comforting arms around us at night and during holidays and when we look at photos. For those that are dealing with dysfunction in their families, we thank you, Father God, that even though we're all broken, you didn't allow us to be shattered. And so, Father God, for those families, I pray that you will continue to pick up those pieces and mold back those beautiful pieces of clay that you have created from your own hands in which you've created what you call your loved ones, your children, us as human beings. Father God, whatever prayers uh, need to be lifted up today, you know through the hearts and minds, you know everything. Yet, Lord, you would love for us to interact with you. That's why we pray. You want us to to, to, to cry with you. You want us to be angry and talk it out with you. You want us to come to you and just rejoice. And Father, we thank you for being so excellent. We thank you for your mercy, your love, and your grace. We thank you that when situations seem real bad, you can change it in a matter of minutes and make them all good. Yet, Father God, though we may have to walk through this pilgrim's path and there may be drama in entire life. At least we know that as long as we hold on to your lifeline, no matter what happens, we have victory at the end. It doesn't matter what you've lost on this side of eternity. It's what you gain in eternity that matters. So, Father God, be with every family that is here. Be with every man, woman, and child around this world. And we pray that somebody accepts Jesus Christ into their life this very moment. And so, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of this day, and as we may depart from one another, we ask that you will be with this edifice, this church. Help us to build together. Help us to praise together. Help us to unite together. Lord God, we will be that beacon of light for this community. And be with all our other churches and all our brothers and sisters as well. And until that inevitable day of Jesus Christ is coming, we pray, Lord, that we never forget that there is always a lifeline. Now forgive us of our sins and blot out our transgressions. Order our steps and guide us in your path of righteousness. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the church of the living God say amen, amen, and amen.